Uh, going to speak with Daniel Harris in just a minute uh, about tonight's relegation playoff, effectively, um, between Swansea and Southampton. But obviously we'll talk about Alex Ferguson as well. Here's Brian Kerr speaking with Nathan after OTB's live commentary game. Chelsea won Liverpool nil on Sunday. Here he is in his own experience of dealing with Alex Ferguson over the years. I had dealings going back to when I was manager on Patsy. I, I remember speaking to him about trying to get along with a player, a lad called Derek Brazil at one time, who was a youth player who played on our youth teams under Liam Toohey. And I, I, I called Old Trafford and uh, I, I didn't get him immediately. But he, I, was, I was working in the lab in the science, in the ag science at the time in UCD. And I got a call back. A lad that walked me, Declan O'Donnell, unfortunately passed away last week. But Declan came down to where I was actually walking. He said, look, there's a bloke on the phone. He says he's Alex Ferguson. <laughs> but I'm not having And he looked at me as if to say, I said, well, it might be. So we did. And he, in fairness to him, he checked it out. He said, he came back to me. He said, look, he's a hamster injury. I said, the last thing I need is a player with a hamstring injury. I've got four of them already. Four set the house, including Pat Tolan was one of them at the time, Johnny McDonald. But uh, anyway, I had dealings with him after his manager at Royal. I have to say, you know, once we had that initial discussion about Roy's availability and so on, he, 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 it was easy for me to work with him. I think there was a I certainly respect on my part. I think he respected my job and the way I was trying to do it and tried to understand the, the pressure he was under to, in that one particular season, they were out of the run in the league and it was uh, it was probably the season 2004. And they were they were chasing the cup at that stage. It was coming towards the cup semi-final and I had to do a little bit of cooperation with him in terms of not selecting the players, John O'Shea and, and, and uh, I think it was John Roy and maybe even Liam Miller at that time, Lord rest him. And, you know, I said, look, I won't pick them for, for it. It was a friendly game. And th- we got on fine. Mm-hmm. I, always, I found him very cooperative and understanding of the job I was trying to do. It's uh, Brian Kerr speaking in the aftermath of uh, the commentary game where Chelsea beat Liverpool at the weekend with Nathan. Now, Daniel Harris is on the line. Good morning to you, Daniel. How are you doing? Morning. Hiya. Yeah, so we should talk about Alex Ferguson first. Obviously, the um, outpouring of warmth and support is really nothing less than you would expect for a figure as important as Alex Ferguson, given what he is currently uh, undergoing at the moment. Um, it's always very hard for, for people to kind of find the right tone in circumstances like this because nobody really wants to believe exactly what is happening. No, I know, but um, it's one of those things because the thing about Fergie is it's not simply that he did lots of good things in football, but there's uh, an inordinate amount of love for him from all sorts of different people because, uh, I mean, what Brian was talking about, for example, about the various players who played for him. And the thing about Fergie was that he was he didn't just take pride in the great players that he had, but he took just as much pride in players who weren't good enough to make the grade at United, who went off elsewhere and played for other teams and did well there, or just grew into what he considered to be good men. And he had taught them how one of, he had taught them some of the ways of doing that because uh, in the end, like he was a football man. But what was his his real genius was his genius for people, and I think that's why people warmed to him so much. Even people who didn't like him respected that about him. Yeah, I, I think you know we also probably forget that when uh, Brian Kerr is talking about a centre-half that's on the books at Manchester United, Alex Ferguson would have probably at some stage along the line scouted him himself and certainly would have had conversations about this individual as somebody that he wanted to know about to make sure that he was worth having at the club. So that's the point you're talking about really, that everybody who passed through Old Trafford for a very long period of time were on his radar in some way. Yeah, that's that. and a lot, of, a lot of them came when they were young, so they'd have known their parents and so he'd have worked out that individual and thought about that individual how do I get the best from this individual how do I get the best for that individual if they're not for me because in the end he understood that talent isn't democratic but um, you still have to look after the people who for whatever reason just don't have that talent and I think he also understood and this is really important this is really why he had so much success is that he understood that football is simple and a lot of people don't even get that far. And he also understood that people are complicated, understands that people are complicated. And being able to match those two things is the best way of getting the most out of human beings who play football. And not everyone is able to do that. We see people who are able to relate to certain characters, like Jose Mourinho, I guess, is the most obvious comparator. He's very good at getting the best out of maniacs. He's less good at getting the best out of introverts. 
for Fergie, that wasn't the case. He melded a team of all sorts of different people from all sorts of different cultures with all sorts of different characters and backgrounds, and he got the best out of them again and again and again. And no one in the history of football has been able to refresh teams in the same way. And if you look at football as this finite thing, you have to kick the round thing into the rectangular thing. That, that, that's not going to change, but different characters do change and the culture of society also changes. Yeah, like it's interesting that you bring up Jose there because it is interesting timing when we have this conversation and in terms of respect, as you also mentioned there a few moments ago, it seems that that respect was hugely born out of the fact that whatever happened in the dressing room stayed in the dressing room with regards to the hair dryer treatment, etc, etc. But when he got out of the dressing room, when, jo when Alex Ferguson faced the media, he would defend you to the nth degree, whereas we don't always see that currently uh, in, the, in the current regime at Manchester United. Like that's surely a huge factor in the respect that Alex Ferguson has. Um, I guess it's, I, I feel bad like, kind of using what's happened to Fergie as a stick with which to beat Mourinho, but I think that there's a slight distinction between uh, what we're saying here is that I think Fergie often did lay into his players in the press if he thought they really deserved it, but I think the difference with Fergie was he didn't bear grudges. So if you had words with him, then he would go home and come back the next day, and generally that would be the end of it. Whereas with Mourinho, you feel like if someone annoyed him three years ago, He's still trying to find a way of getting back at them, and that even counts for his own players. So the players that he takes a dislike to, it seems like it's very hard for them to convince him otherwise. The so only, and he didn't like Anthony Martial in the first place, <laughs> and whatever he's done, he still doesn't like him. And whereas he likes the Manu Matic, he likes the Kaku, and uh, I mean, he talked uh, after the Brighton game. The Kaku is a good example. He always say to me, "Why the Kaku? Why the Kaku? Why the Kaku?" What you saw tonight is because why it's always the Kaku. Now, I look at that and I think Lukaku didn't score for about 10 games over in the winter and he wasn't playing well either. So that's not really fair on him or on someone like Marcus Rashford or Martial, who's come in having not started the game since whoever knows when. But he likes Lukaku, and he likes Matic and he likes their focus and he likes the way they go about things. So they're given it, they're excused poor performances in a way that players like someone like Anthony Martial, whose personality probably doesn't chime quite with Mourinho's, he has to have a bad half and you don't see him for three weeks. Fergie wasn't really like that. Yeah. Um, the only, the only um, maybe people worth pointing out that sometimes he did have a, a grudge. At the end, there was definitely a grudge with Roy Keane and you would say potentially there was a grudge against Beckham, which the Beckham one certainly eased with the passage of time. I'm not sure the Keane one did. Yeah, th yeah that, that's, that's true as well. I think what you saw with Fergie really was the grudges only began against his own players when they were no longer useful to him. So he fell out with Keane when Keane was, was finished, more or less. He fell out with Beckham when he felt that the team needed to move on. He needed to refresh that midfield, and Beckham was the player he felt he could most do without. Uh, Ruben Nistelrooy is another one. He fell out with Ruben Nistelrooy when the team needed to move on. But it's interesting that of all the people he's fallen out with, with the exception of Roy Keane, the players have always come back to him. Um, and there's always been some kind of rapprochement, and it seems like it's usually motivated by the players. So I think that... When I talk about bearing grudges, I'm talking more on a day-to-day -day basis with people that are going to stay being at the club. Of course, Fergie has an amazing fury, I'm sure, and will always fall out with someone. But perhaps another distinction with Fergie is that he always felt like, in terms of those personnel issues, always did what was best for Manchester United. Whereas Mourinho almost feels like sometimes he wants the team to get beaten so that it proves, so that it gives its confirmation bias against the players that he already didn't like. So against Brighton, after the Brighton game, he said, I told the players what was going to happen. It's like, well, if you're so good at predicting what was going to happen, why didn't you prevent it from happening? And also telling the players that they're going to lose. I mean, I can sort of understand why that is some kind of motivational tool. But if you thought that was going to happen, that just doesn't sound really right. And actually, were you giving players, were you giving players rope to hang themselves on the basis that this is, you're playing a team that try and avoid relegation. So they're going to be giving everything. Your own team don't need the points in the league and there's a cup final coming up. So it feels like you're saying, well, you go there, play badly, and then I'll be justified in not picking you for a few more weeks. It does sometimes feel that way with Mourinho. Yeah, no, for sure. One last thing just then before we leave this and talk about tonight's game. Um, the, the bit at, um, it, it was Old Trafford, where Wenger is there getting his kind of ceremonial goodbye and Ferguson's gesturing to Mourinho. It felt like, it felt like Manchester United finally made peace with the fact that they have this absolute iconic behemoth manager who is around the place and has a role to play and he's still the boss, but actually it was a benevolent level of uh, post-dictatorship from Ferguson in a way that probably wasn't, you know, you couldn't have said that was 
that relationship was comfortable when Moyes was there or even when somebody as egotistical as Louis van Gaal was there. Yeah, it's interesting, that Fergie situation, because it felt like when Moyes got the job without a single credential that made him suitable for the job. I mean, if you think about Fergie himself, he had to bash the old firm in Scotland and win a European trophy with Aberdeen to get the United job at a time when United weren't even any good. Whereas Moyes came nowhere near doing any of that stuff and got to take over the champions. It seemed like one of the subtexts was an opportunity for Fergie to retain control. I'm going to give this job, I'm going to give the job to this guy who's going to be thankful for a job that he can't possibly have expected to get and must at some level know he hasn't deserved. So that Fergie would then get asked about things because there would be a gratefulness and a respect. That didn't really seem to happen. And obviously Van Gaal didn't ask either. And it also seems like Mourinho doesn't really ask just because there are things that happen that have happened under Mourinho that would never have happened under Fergie. Martial, for example, is a player that you think that Fergie would have found a way of working with and getting the most from. But um, what's happening now, what that sort of seemed a little bit like was almost like Fergie saying to Mourinho, look, son, this is how you act like a mensch. I know you have fallen out with this person, but actually this is the way that this is the way that we go about things. And one of the things about Fergie that was different to some of the other people that succeeded Matt Busby was Fergie loved the fact that Busby was there just as an authority figure, someone to learn from, someone to respect. Whereas the people that came immediately after Busby, basically Franco Farrell was intimidated by Busby, Busby because Busby, Busby was involved in the selection process. He was still there. And the players still came to tell Busby, to sneak to Busby about what was going on. And you can see why when, Marie, when Moyes inherited Fergie's players, he might have felt that too. But it also said a lot about Fergie that he immediately embraced the fact that this football genius was there on tap for him and he went to him and asked him questions because there were things to ask him whereas uh, I'm not sure Mourinho either is so into that I mean he pays lip service to the genius of Fergie which he even did when he was the Chelsea manager and it felt a bit patronizing at the beginning when uh, Mourinho was winning Fergie wasn't but it seems odd that there's never been that kind of relationship but at the same time you understand why there isn't that relationship because the manager has to be his own man rather than just kind of hectoring the person that was there before about times past. So it's difficult, but yeah, there are a lot of times when I've thought, I think you should ask Fergie about that one. Yeah, well, hopefully he makes a full recovery and we get to see him back in the stands sooner rather than later. Got to talk to you about tonight and the um, Swansea-Southampton game. Southampton at the weekend were on the verge of safety. So you can take that two ways. There's a, a sense that okay, we're actually good enough to be able to get out of this or we're doomed because of the uh, equaliser six minutes into stoppage time. It's a challenge for Mark Hughes to find the right tone and if there was one of many criticisms that you could make of Mark Hughes, it was that I would never have suggested that he was like the, the, the best at rabble rousing and the best at... Um, he always seems a little bit pissed off with how life is going. Um, yeah, it's uh, the, that man. It seems like he has no conception whatsoever of happiness, Mark Hughes. Um, but one of my favourite interviews with Mark Hughes is um, United, United at home to Liverpool in 92-93. They're 2-0 down and Hughes scores two brilliant goals to uh, draw them back to 2 all. And then the interview afterwards, uh, they ask him and he says, uh, yes, those are the kind of goals that I never score, aren't they? Like just this most classically joyless interview after he's done something brilliant. It's on YouTube if uh, anyone wants to have a look. But I think that the, this game is, I can't wait for this game, because this is really what football is about, where we're guaranteed almost some amazing misery at the end of it, juxtaposed against some amazing joy. And that is, that is exactly what football is about. It brings us that kind of thing that it's acceptable to enjoy, whereas in ordinary life, we're generally not supposed to enjoy the immense misery of other people. I think with Southampton is that they know that they're much too good to be where they are. I mean, obviously they're not because this is how many points they've got. So this is how many points they've earned and this is how many points they deserve. But they've got a lot of quality, Southampton. If things had gone even half well this season, they'd be nowhere near where they are. Um, they haven't scored enough goals, but they do have players that can score goals, that can make goals. And Swansea have lost, I think, three in a row. So I'd be pretty surprised if Southampton didn't find a way of getting out of this because they've just got better players than Swansea in the end. And I think that hopefully Hughes... What Hughes does have is righteous indignation and he's enjoyed a lot of righteous indignation in some situations where he is not righteous and he's also got no business being indignant. So I would imagine he should be able to engender some kind of mongrel behaviour in his players tonight. And in the end, you do want a manager to inspire the players, but these guys are really professionals. Like The amount they've had to sacrifice to get from where they began to where they are now tells you that they've got some mental strength and some pride and I would expect them to deliver some sort of performance tonight. 
Yeah, for sure. You mentioned it there that they've completely underachieved this season, Southampton. Potentially the Premier League's biggest underachiever is in the context of this season alone. To what extent do you think that they are like Newcastle of a couple of seasons ago, where they're good enough to maintain the level of talent they have within the squad and go right back up to the Premier League next season, should they get relegated? I guess all that would always depend on who the manager is, if it's Hughes or not, and who they're able to keep and the money that they're able to spend. Probably... They, you would expect Southampton that would have enough infrastructure, enough money to be able to spend their way out of the championship pretty quickly because it seems like not, not everyone will leave and players might decide to give them a year. So I would be surprised if Southampton weren't able to come back up, but I think I'd be quite surprised if Southampton went down. But I've been saying that for quite a long time now and uh, here we are and they might go down. Hmm. Would you agree that the best result for the neutral tonight would be a draw so that we can potentially see this great escape from West Brom? Because it strikes me that Darren Moore right now is the most likable man in football. I, um, I, and part of me thinks is that because we don't know him yet. But no, uh, yeah, he, do, he does seem like a really sound guy. So yeah, it would be, it would be nice to see him. And uh, away fans all over the country will want the Vine Pub to stay in the Premier League because uh, the Vine Pub is a, a Premier League pub. So there is that. But um, I think it comes back to that thing of, if, it, if it's a draw tonight, then that does take it to the last game of the season, which will be exciting. But the, I mean, I'm kind of dreaming about the looks on the faces at the end of the game tonight if we get a positive result. And uh, the only way we're going to get that is if, uh, is if we get that positive result. So it would be nice. I, I, I would happily see, I'd happily see West Brom stay up ahead of, ahead of Southampton, ahead of Swansea, because uh, as you say, I like Darren Moore. And to get out, of, to get from where they were to where they are would be perhaps the greatest escape that we've ever seen. So. Uh, it's a rare occasion, whereas fans of football, fans of Premier League football, it's win-win, I think. Thank you, great stuff. Enjoy the game tonight. Thanks a million. All right, see you again. See you guys. Bye.